Good morning, Montana. Um, welcome back to the Montana State University Montana Agriculture Experiment Station Virtual Field Days question and answer scenario from 10 to 11 o'clock. Um, we have four new contestants and participants in our program this, this morning. I um, want to thank you for all your participation and good questions um, from the previous hour and keep them coming in. Um, at this time, I'm going to introduce our, our uh, individual speakers today. And, uh, Dr. Chen C. Chen from Eastern Ag Research Center in North, uh, Northeastern Montana. Dr. Kent McVeigh from Southern Ag Research Center. Dr. Jessica Torian from Northwestern Ag Research Center. And Ms. Peggy Lamb for Northern Ag Research Center up on the High Line. So uh, with that, let's go to Chen C. And Chen C, you want to give us a quick update on who you are and what you do? Okay. Thank you, Darren. Um, <clears throat> my name is Chen Si Chen. Um, I'm an agronomist and a superintendent at the Eastern Ag Research Center. Uh, first, let me give you some um, information about the research center in uh, Eastern and Sydney. So um, our research center has two farms, one dry land and one irrigate farm, and that allow us to do both uh, dry land and irrigate research. And the research center has uh, two research programs. One is the uh, plant pathology research program led by Dr. Frankie Crutcher, and I am leading an agronomy research program. So for agronomy research program, I have been doing a lot of uh, variety testing. So we have both on-farm and off-station variety testing for wheat, barley, durum, pea, lentil, chickpea, canola, and sugar beet um, crops. And besides, uh, in addition to the variety trial, we also do some um, fertility study for sugar beet. So I have a project that uh, doing, try to do no-till planting for sugar beet and also try to figure out what's the nutrient management strategy for no-till sugar beet. And for alternative crop, um, recently we start variety testing and seeding days for industrial hands. Um, and we also have another project working on mung bean and ajoki bean, try to develop some um, warm season alternative pulse crop for Montana. So that's all I have. And go back to you, Darren. Thank you, Chen C. Let's go to Jessica up in the northwestern part of the state. Good morning. My name is Jessica, and I'm located at the Northwestern Ag Research Center. Um, I was I'm, I was hired six years ago as a field crop physiologist. Uh, basically, my program um, cut across uh, disciplines. Um, I I have programs that are dealing with nutrients, and then dealing with um, moisture regime or water productivity, and then these two things also intersect. So um, I'm looking at interaction between these two um, large input of production, nutrients and water. Um, three years ago, I became the superintendent of the Northwestern Ag Research Center. So I, just as others, you know, we wear multiple hats. Um, I, I'm gonna try breeding program as well, working with the breeders. Um, now we ventured on alternative crops, um, increasing the amount of study for forages. Uh, this year at the northwestern side of Montana, we started off a bit cooler and um, a bit more of rainfall that we received. And then in August, it, I mean, in, um, last week of July, we warmed up really quick. So we might be able to harvest our winter wheat here pretty soon, maybe next week. Um, so now um, I think we're catching up with irrigation as well. So mm -hmm. if you have questions with regards to um, nutrient management that um, cross over uh, water productivity and stuff like that and alternative crops, um, I will try my best to answer those questions um, based on what I only do. Um, but I guess that's the general um, update on my program. The one thing that we're excited here is we have a new faculty member, Clint Byerman, um, that will uh, focus on the cropping system side and also the biotic side 
of research because my program was in the abiotic, meaning the non-living things like water and nutrient. So that's it for me for now. Thank you, Jessica. Let's make another X all the way across the state of Montana to Kent McVeigh. There you go. You got to hold it down. You're still muted. What if I hold this down? Perfect. Ah, after you knew how to run this thing here. My name is Kent McVeigh. I'm at the Southern Ag Research Center uh, down near Billings in, at, at Huntley, actually. And uh, I'm the extension, uh, extension cropping system specialist for the state. And so I do a little bit of research as well. Uh, here at the station, I do all the off-station trials for variety trials for uh, spring wheat, winter wheat, barley, uh, peas, lentils, chickpeas. And we do that all around the region and then also on station. Uh, we have a few rotation studies over the years. I've got a new one I just started about last year where it's a strip crop, strip, strip crops. So we have 11 treatments and then the second year we plant perpendicular to that. So we can look at the rotations of, of wheat on winter wheat on uh, crops like flax or like uh, following peas, those kinds of studies. Uh, I have a cover crop study that's been going on for about six years. And uh, fertility study, we've done some work with uh, uh, Jamie Sherman with the breeding program at barley and looking at nitrogen response of those barley crops. She has some low protein uh, genes that she's added into some barley uh, rice. We're really just doing an evaluation of those. I've done a little bit with water use efficiency. We've got a study, and actually chensi has got the same study duplicated at, at Eastern, uh, looking at uh, water use on peas and chickpeas, and then I added in wheat just as a comparison. So we can talk about any of those issues. Outstanding, Kent. Thank you. Let's go north to Peggy. I hear harvest is underway at uh, the Triangle. Uh, yeah, so, um, am I muted? muted? Yep, you're good. Uh, okay, so I actually started harvest on mon Monday. Um, we harvested some peas Monday and got into winter wheat yesterday, uh, several pea trials out and winter wheat trials out. Um, I'll back up, introduce myself to you guys. Uh, I've worked for Montana State University uh, for 21 years. I've been at Northern Ag for 18, 18 years. Uh, my program focuses mainly on variety testing and variety development, but in any given year, I have 25 to 30 different collaborators. Um, you may have heard Plain Jones earlier, um, beyond the, the five breeders, um, crops breeders at Montana State. Um, I also do uh, help out with fertility trials, seed treat trials. Um, we have a lot of wheat stem soft lie up here, so uh, our station is the one that uh, both private industry, Montana State University, Washington State University, different universities come to for uh, screening their either products or their varieties or their developmental lines in a wheat stem soft lie environment. Um, we do a lot of alternative crop testing. If somebody wants to find out if they're crops can grow here. Uh, we have some uh, brassica gensia again with a private company. It's grown well here in the past. They're trying to get it um, to market in the States. And um, we jumped back in this year and have um, collaborative research and uh, variety testing for those guys. Um, we service a five county area up here. So we have like Kent does in his part of the county or part of the state. We go off station with our winter wheat, spring wheat, um, and Durham testing uh, to Phillips County, Loring to Turner, uh, down to Loma, Big Sandy, Chester, uh, try to help out with anything, anywhere that we can, wherever it's a fit and what we can make fit into the program. Uh, our off station testing, um, the growers of Montana, the, the cereal producers of Montana are ultimately who pays for this for their checkout checkoff dollars um, that are administered through the Montana Wheat and Barley Committee. So we have to put a huge shout out out of thank you. Um, we could not be doing any of this off-station research without that 
wheat and barley um, support that we get um, through a grant that we write every year uh, to help partially support this off station work. Um, we also do fer fertility testing. Uh, we submit proposals to the Montana Fertilizer Assessment Council. Um, we get funding for that, again, through checkoff dollars. And this really helps with research throughout the state of Montana. So we got to have shout, shout out a big thanks to that council also. Wonderful. Thank you, Peggy. Um, the first question actually for Chen C, and he dropped out for some reason, uh, must be a low bandwidth. So I'll, we'll get him logged back in and we'll come back to him. Um, Jessica, there's a question here from uh, the triangle that said, it asked a question about you did some work on water regimes and wheat protein yields. Could you quickly summarize that and how that might impact what happens in the triangle in a dry land environment versus an irrigated environment? Yeah, sure. Thank you for asking the, that question. So there is definitely a, um, a, a relationship between a high yielding environment when, we, when you try an irrigating wheat. Um, uh, first, I will talk about the generic aspect of it and then I could go down to the, the specific trait, um, say for instance, you know, stay green versus high grain protein like Egan that we've had before. Um, but first, generally, when when we irrigate wheat, it, it, especially if we irrigate it well and it's no stress type of, of watering, that would mean that the yield would increase and the protein level would also decrease. And, and that is because of, of production of, of carbohydrates in the seed and it, some of them get diluted when you have too much uh, productivity in your system. On the other hand, if you have a rain-fed environment where your number of seeds per head or the number of spike per unit area of land is limited because of your drought or your limited watering environment, then your protein would go up. Um, and it is because in that environment, your yield is low. So it's a kind of a fine balance that you have to do. What we're finding is um, watering is, is really sensitive from tillering stage to flower. Um, you could you know, apply more irrigation at milk, um, but I think applying more irrigation sometime in the medium milk to close to soft dough is actually a bit of counterproductive because uh, for one thing, the response is very little or, or none. And so in that respect, um, you may be just adding water for um, not very good response um, in your um, irrigated system. Um, but at the same time, you know, it doesn't do anything anymore for yield. So, uh, you know, with falling number, um, also that's kind of a different story where when uh, talking about quality, not just protein, but falling number is where there's um, an enzyme on the seed that acts on the seed um, um, and, and converts basically um, starts into sugar. So that's one thing that we are discounted when we deliver our grains to the elevator. And so when we, um, during a wet environment, for instance, on a rainy season um, towards harvest, the falling number would go down. That means um, you're, that's kind of critical for discount. Um, but um, also when you irrigate later in the season too, your falling number tends to go down. So that's one of, of, of one of my uh, purpose of the research program that I do is um, basically developing a, a simple rule of thumb uh, in a way because irrigation is somewhat is a combination of science and art, right? So at some point when, when science becomes complicated, we look at the art side and, and look at the rule of thumb in terms of what aspects of production are going to be affected. So that's kind of the general um, sense of the um, of irrigation, irrigating wheat. Um, the, the one thing though, is that when you play with traits, for instance, like stay green trait, stay great green trait will definitely yield more um, compared to other varieties like Vida, for instance. Um, 
The thing with that is that if you irrigate it for more later on, then it will remain green and then you have low protein. Um, with uh, Egan, for instance, that has high grain protein um, content, even if you irrigate it for, for longer, it will still have uh, grain protein that is at least 14% and above. So that's a difference between those traits. And, and as I said, one of, uh, in my program, I'm kind of crossovering, you know, agronomy um, and, and also different traits. So I think I will stop there. Thanks, Jessica. Hey, can I ask a question about Jessica? Please. The, uh, so lodging issues with, with uh, irrigated wheat or irrigated barley, seems to me it's, it's water, late water more than nitrogen. Uh, sometimes people blame it on excess nitrogen. Actually, I have a nitrogen study with, with uh, Jamie and I've got like two times the rate that we actually need just so I have this response and I'm seeing no lodging in that barley where it's, it's nitrogen, but I do see lodging in wheat when we irrigate late. And I was just wondering your thoughts on that. Yeah, so thank you for that question, Kent. So lodging is, is a mechanical, um, it's related to a kind of a plant. Um, if, if the stalk is not very sturdy enough or it gets really tall, um, and also there's a mechanical aspect of that, right? When an overhead sprinkler hits on that multiple times. So what happened is lodging is a is kind of like a domino effect. So once when when you have a sprinkler on and a group of plants are lodged a little bit, so it's a domino effect and it, it they're going all together like this and lodged at a certain angle. But you are right. Um, I think I think the nitrogen a level that I've observed is just extending the, the green tissues, um, but lodging is, is, is water has a little bit of contribution to lodging. And, and if, if you remember, um, if you look at the, the grass as a species, it has a, it has a node to node, right? And you have a stem. What happened is, say for instance, June, and, and you like to irrigate because you know, my electricity will get cut off because there's some, it's, you know, in a normal year, your June temperature gets really high. There's demand for other uses like the urban um, dwellers. And so you get cut off, your power supply get cut off. And this is the question I've, I've been um, asked with a number of producers before, like, what do I do because my power supply gets cut off? So I'm just gonna irrigate here until I can and then stop later. But the, the problem with that is that um, this node to node of, of a grass species is that when you have a lot of moisture and the temperature is high, this node is extended really longer. And so that is when you tend to have a taller plant when you have good moisture amount and high temperature. And so I think you're right. Um, here in our production field, I asked our farm manager to stop irrigating already when we have, you know, milk, because as soon as there's a repetitive um, action of the sprinkler and one plant of blood, just as I said, it's a domino effect. Perfect. Thanks, Jessica. Thanks, Kent. Good questions. Um, welcome back, Chen C. We're glad you're back. Um, the first question right out of the bunch was for you. Um, there's rumors that you had industrial hemp trials at Eastern Ag Research Center. Can you talk a little bit about those and how you see that fitting in Montana? You're muted. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's not enough rumor. We do have a industrial hemp trial at Eastern Ag Research Center. So we start to study the hemp since 2019. So basically, in 2019, we did a variety trial and a seeding date study under irrigation. So the 2019 the trial meaning for the hemp that have a dual purpose, either for grain production or for both grain product and fiber production. So we found the seeding day is critical for ham production in Montana because uh, particularly for the for the seed production 
because the, um, we have to seed early. As early seeding we produce higher seed yield uh, because we have a short growing season. So if you plant too late, probably hemp will not going to mature and produce a seed. Um, in 2020, actually we have two ad additional two variety trials. So one is a variety trial for grain and fiber production. The other trial is strictly grow hemp for CBD production. That's a, those are um, people you grow hemp, so you need to know what genetic used for what purpose. So the grain and fiber and the CBD, CBD production, they are completely different genetic. So any further question on that? Nope, we'll see what comes in. Okay. Thank you, Chen C. Kent from Cutbank. Um, they said they were driving down the road and saw flax and chickpeas being planted together. Can you talk about what that adds to a cropping rotation or what's what's happening there, please? So this is a, a practice that's been gaining popularity in Canada. And actually, I know Chen C's got a study and we have a study here where we've inter intercropped flax and chickpea. And the idea is that the flax will reduce the movement of, of Ascochyta across the field. And so that's why you're seeing that. I, I don't know that we really have the data to say that it actually does. I don't even know if Canada really has the data to say that it actually does reduce that movement, but that's the theory behind it. And so those plots are pretty important for us to evaluate here at Huntley and also at Eastern to see, get some data here in Montana to see if that really is an effective practice or not. Uh, to follow up with the cancer comment on that, um, we do have a plant pathology, a plant pathologist, uh, Dr. Kren uh, Frankie Crutcher actually is a, um, a team member for this project. So she's evaluating the incidence, incidence and the severity of the Ezekiah for this intercropping um, trial. And we have a graduate student try to use the sports trap to see actually we can <clears throat> track to the spawn movement from the chickpea to other plants. So, yeah. so, so if I could follow up on that for both uh, Kent and Chen C. So what you're saying are, is the goal to increase number of years to grow chickpeas or just a preventative measure or is it what's what's the theory behind I mean, I understand asking guys not moving across the field, but what ultimately is it going to let them grow it more often or just prevent it from when they grow it? Okay, that's two purposes. So one is uh, because if you use a herbicide, we try to reduce that, use the uh, in, in, uh, fungicide. Okay, so if you use the fungicide again and again, probably can produce, uh, develop the resistance to the fungicides. So that's one purpose. The second purpose is um, for organic production. You don't have the option to use uh, uh, in, uh, fungicide to control Ascochyta, um, right? So this, the idea is uh, if you, this can in, intercropping flag with the chickpea can reduce it, uh, disease incidence or severity, then probably this practice can use in the organic production system. So I, I have a follow-up question for that, Jensi. Mm -hmm. Or Kent, when you guys are seeding it or when guys are seeding it, they're harvesting both seed, the flax and the chickpea, and then separating them? Yeah, that's that's the idea is that you'll harvest it together and then take it back and, and screen out the flax and the, it's pretty easy to separate if you have the cleaning equipment to be able to do it. Right. But you get both crops as, you know, as, as something that you can economically benefit from. The, one of the questions is, is what kind of seeding rate should you have? How much competition is flax going to give to chickpea and vice versa? I mean, mostly chickpea is probably the biggest money maker of those two crops, but uh, you don't want to really severely reduce your chickpea yield. And so that's the other study that's going on is just rates to see if they can really uh, predict what the impact to yield would be. And what about every other row? 
versus seated together in the same row. We have. Um, That's also part of the study. Yeah, <laughs> Becky, we do have. It looked like a uh, alternate road work better than a complete mix configuration. So yeah, Becky, uh, <laughs> Peggy, thank you for the question. Actually, the separating flag from chippy is not the issue. I think the major challenge is uh, harvesting them, how to set the combine to stretch both uh, flags and chickpea because you know, the seed size is uh, so different. So, and if you adjust too tight, then we're probably going to crash the chickpea. So that, that's a, is a challenge. Yeah. Good, good point. Good discussion. It sounds like the jury's still out on, on intercropping those two crops, but we have work on it. So thank you. Thank you for all you guys doing the work on that. So um, Peggy, in from Kremlin, Montana, um, what is the status of the winter broadleaves? What's living, what's winter killing, and do you have any updates on that? So on the winter broadleaf side, uh, that was one of the things that we harvested on Monday. We here at the research center planted um, winter pea from Kevin McPhee's breeding program. Uh, he has been working on um, breeding winter pea for our area. And two years in a row, we've, you know, excited that we've actually been able to harvest seed from these winter peas. Um, this year, more than last, we did not have a great winter with great cover here in North Central Montana. So I really think if we were going to kill a lot of winter peas last year, would have been a great year to do it. Um, some of the plots looked really, really good. Other, you know, not so much. So I'm very hopeful for, for that breeding program um, that we can get something, something released, that Kevin's program can get something released because it is, the, his lines are, are doing very well. Um, he's taken selections and we're going to seed it again this this fall. Uh, we haven't had winter canola here in two years, um, but there were winter canolas from the um, program in Kansas. These are grown also down every other year, I believe, in Bozeman. Um, they, they made it through the winter. I don't have yields on those. I don't know that yields were taken. It was just put them in to see if they would make it. Um, there is promise for the winter canola up here also and breeding programs are working on them. Um, like Jamie Sherman's program, she's also working on winter barleys. Uh, we have not grown any of those up here, but um, very hopeful that that would be another fall seeded crop that we could get into. Thanks, Peggy. And, and just a plug, we will have the breeders here between two and three o'clock on the YouTube live channel. We'll be able to ask specific questions of those breeders on those programs. And I, I think Chen C. Kent, you both have a little bit of winter stuff too. Do you have any other comments on winter broadleafs? We we tried that um, winter camelina, it can survive here. Uh, winter cam camelina right now seems not much market. However, there's a lot of interest using winter camelina as a cover crop. So that do have a potential and that do able to survive our winter in Sydney area. Uh, we, we tried winter pea and winter lentil look like a winter pea, um, the survivability pretty low, uh, probably now actually the Kevin's breeding program and the USDA Pullman program have a newer lines might have uh, better winter hardiness, but we haven't tested that. But winter lentil doing very well here. Again, winter lentil can survive here and have potential use as a cover crop or just harvest for seed. And along the Yellowstone River, that region as a winter lentil can do very well. So, yeah. Kent? Yeah, I don't have any uh, broadleaves from the winter, but I know that there's some producers growing some winter lentils down through the or towards Heisham. And uh, when uh, our last weed scientist had some work with, with winter lentil, it was quite successful here. Jessica, do you have any winter broadleaves so that you're playing with? So, not, not, um, not this year. Um, I, I think the, the one thing that we learn here in the Northwestern side is we learn from the producers. As you traveled, um, maybe if one of you guys had a chance to travel on the, um, this side of the mountain, it's, there are years where winter canola are really surviving and it's great in production fields. And so uh, we learn from the producers uh, out there. And uh, this year, uh, actually maybe two weeks from now or a week from now, 
Clint is uh, Clint Barman, our new cropping systems agronomist, is getting ready for a winter canola trial. He got seeds from the Kansas breeders, and um, and also um, some seeds from the industry to do planting date experiment because, you know, as as the sages was what really wanting us to do is to plant winter canola in August one, and I'm not sure if that fits to our cropping system. So, but we try our best this year because it may be that we're able to cut our production fields uh, like winter week next week and we could break the grounds as quick as we can and maybe we could pull it off like a first week of August winter week canola planting date. So we're excited about that because, you know, one of the survivability during the winter really is the amount of you know, root reserve that you establish before winter, and we don't know that yet over here. So um, I was asked before to do this kind of experiment, but, you know, I didn't have a chance, and now we're excited that Clint is going to do that, and we're, we're looking forward to the outcome for next year. So, so what Jessica just mentioned is a really tough thing for here in Haver around the state. Jessica has water, you know, she can irrigate things up, uh, maybe and more rainfall on on the western side of the state. Mm -hmm. If we turn around, even even in our fallow ground right now, if we were to plant anything, if we were to plant our canola or our peas right now, it's not coming up until we get rain. And if we don't have enough rain to get that root established to the point that you know, it, if it only rains enough for it to sprout and then it dries out again, it's dead before it gets started. Um, we can get it irrigated and get things up. It's a whole different story. So even, even if we were to plant August 1 or August 15, we normally don't get rain until the end of August or early September. And we need, we need that moisture to get these, these fall plants established and, and going. Um, at Kent, or Chensi mentioned winter camelina. We've had winter camelina here at Northern Ag. Um, it grew very well five to eight years ago. Um, we haven't been testing it since. Um, and on the winter canola side, in the along Fort down at Fort Benton, there are a lot of growers around that are doing a very, very good job growing winter canola in different areas. So. Great. Thank you all. Good, good discussion. This in from Sanders County um, goes to you, Jessica. Um, there's they said they heard you're growing Kernza. What is it and what do you see it happening in Montana? So, so yeah. This is our first time that we tried Kernza, and this is, I give credit to my research associate that's more excited to try it than me because I thought, oh, we have to wait for a little bit. But um, so we, we, we tried planting Kernza last um, September. So we had, because we don't know yet how they would be established, so we tried different planting dates. But, but really, Kernza is a trade name that's um, used by the Land Institute in Kansas. They've, they've researched this Kernza um, for over 15 years now. So it's an intermediate wheat grass that originated um, in Europe and west of Asia. And um, I think this was brought in the United States for dual uh, purpose type of, of alter alternative crop. So you could either use it as a forage or as a grain. And and this has been really popular uh, popularized in Kansas and even in Minnesota. And I think, I think uh, this has been supported by the legislature too in terms of their strategy in um, what they call um, constant greening. Or I, I can't remember exactly the term, but it's they want to have green cover for the entire year. And so that's how it got popularized in Minnesota. And and we want to try it here. Uh, the reason we keep trying alternative crops is that producers always want to find ways, you know, especially if, you know, the commodity prices are low and, and making sure they diversify and, and, and have alternatives. So I'm happy to say that the Kernza that we planted in September and October are growing really good. And it just flowered a week ago, it's beautiful flowers. And um, we might be ready to harvest some forage um, samples and grain, maybe, I'm guessing, hopefully by two weeks from now. So it's kind of similar timing, really, when it comes to spring wheat. Um, the one thing that we observe, though, is that if you plant it in spring, um, like April and 
and uh, May. Um, the plans are small and it's not headed. And, and, and if you take a look at that, it might require cold temperature to just like your winter wheat to head. And so we are still um, new to learning Kerns as well. So we are excited to report to you guys what's our biomass and what's our grain outcome. I know that the Minnesota folks have started developing type of currency that is uh, has a human grade consumption, like I don't know for cookie or for malting even, and so no brewing. Sorry, is that the right word? Yeah, um, and so um, yeah. So I guess we're excited about that. It's still fairly new, but it it looks like it survived well on the first year and. And we'll continue um, making measurements for the following year and see how it goes. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Kent, this from Shoto County. Um, can you? I'm gonna I'm gonna rearrange this question because it was really pros and cons of crop rotations in fallow and intensified intensified cropping systems. Can you kind of go through the decision process that a producer needs to go through as they one diversify their operations with different crops? and increasing their cropping intensity from crop fallow into more continuous cropping or flex cropping. In dry land production? I'm assuming, Shoto, yeah. <clears throat> well, you know, it's, uh, uh, we've, we've done studies here, and I know Jensi's also done some studies, rotation studies that show that you can intensify from a uh, winter wheat fallow system to a crop following winter wheat and go into an inert uh, crop every year uh, and be as it depends on the economics of the year. And so the economics change every year. And so it really varies whether that's really economical or not, but there's a definite benefit to rotating just from mostly from a disease control I issue and from in a wind, uh, weed control issue. And so going to say to peas following winter wheat is usually pretty successful because with peas don't, uh, use a lot, they use a lot of surface water, probably down to two, maybe three feet. And so you may drain the profile of water with a winter wheat crop, but that following, you know, that fall and winter recharge gives you enough probably to grow a decent crop, crop of, uh, of uh, peas the following year. And so you can do that with other crops with flax. You can do that with um, canola, probably up there in Shoto County. There's, there's other crops that you need to look at the economics of, of, of the system and you have to look at what you have for equipment as far as being able to plant and harvest. And most of these crops that we grow are, are drilled crops. So you, your same drill that you're drilling wheat can be used to drill most of these other crops. Mustard would be another choice that might work in there. The yield benefit from rotation is, is small, probably you know, five to 10% max, if you see, as compared to a continuous of that crop. And we don't really have good data to really evaluate that here. We can look at other states and see that, but uh, I do have a rotation study. We started this last year where I'm looking at rotation of different crops and we'll be able to see a yield response, but it's gonna be compared to, you know, the same crop planted. So certain crops you don't like flax for example you wouldn't want to plant flax two years in a row the second year it really is poor compared to the first year uh, wheat is not so bad and it's probably because we have pretty good weed control issues it's not as uh, depressing to the following crop for wheat uh, but the oil seeds definitely don't like it from just from a yield perspective but also probably a disease perspective follow up uh, Ken's comments. Um, when you do talking about intensify your cropping system, you really need to look at what kind of precipitation you can get in your area and also what kind of soil you have. So for deep soil, your um, summer fallow is going to preserve moisture for next year. And for shallow soil, you probably summer fallow it's not much benefit because your soil profile only that store that much moisture. So and um, you need to really the growers need to be really careful if you have only less than 14 inches of rainfall, 12 inch rainfall, that um, your annual cropping gonna be really risk risky. So 
you you rather do un, unless you grow one season as a, a forager or something or cover crop. Otherwise, um, you probably consume a lot of moisture for annual cropping, not produce economical uh, yield. That rather doing annual cropping probably better to to do that summer fallow to preserve moisture to get a good year's crop. So. Thank you, Chen C. Thank you, Kent. Um, Jessica, could you talk about your corn trial? Someone drove by and saw corn they're growing there. Is what's going on with the corn in northwestern Montana? Yeah. So people were asking me, why are you planting corn there? And it's still up, you know, in January. <laughs> so um, so corn is one of those things that has been um, brought up by our farmer advisory committee. Um, and that is because um the the south of the flathead lake uh farmers have tried them before and and some of them are successful except you know the drying down time could be problematic so so we we started planting corn last year and and we only had two relative maturity that we tried 75 and 80 days and um we tried uh four planting dates or actually three so we have, you know, late April, um, uh, early May, and then third week of May around that area at time. So, so I think our goal is to really add to, you know, the knowledge out there in terms of the choice of relative maturity and what's your optimal timing. Because, you know, as you know, corn loves warm weather it's a it's a warm season um, grass and so us planting corn in april is somewhat like questionable but but for the past two years now um, corn has grown really good even if we plant it in april and i think what it is is that uh, based on research out there is that there's a critical window of uh, imbibation of moisture into the seed when you plant it. So I think for as long as, you know, your soil temperature does not fall um, below 50 degree uh, within the four to eight hour of, of planting. Um, so you're kind of safe in there. Um, there are, this year, May, for instance, had temperature that were lower than April. So it's a, a little bit of a story there. Um, what we're finding is that when there's cooler temperature, there's a little bit of discoloration in the tissues, you know, that you know that plants are reacting to the cold temperature, but it recovers immediately. And so uh, I think now, for instance, um, on, on our soil temperature, when we plant at the depth, that is a different temperature compared to our ambient, right? Usually soil will store more heat and um, it's a bit warmer. But if you have a no-till ground, you know, it could be a bit cooler than the ambient temperature. So that's the only difference. But um, here we planted it on a, on a cultivated ground. So um, the soil temperature was a bit warmer um, than the ambient temperature by one or two degrees um, warmer. So um, yeah, uh, for, we harvest them for forage last year, and we have to do the same thing this year too. We also harvest them for grain. We harvested our corn grain. Uh, we let them dry down during the winter, and we harvest them them in January. So everybody's wearing their coat and they're nice, you know. Pick up the heads one by one, and and it, we, you know we have fun harvesting those stuff. So you know, I think if you're interested, we don't have much time. If you're interested with the data, just shoot me an email and I could provide it to you in terms of the effect of the planting date and also with the forage and the grain at the kernel yield. Thanks, Jessica. Is that also on your web page? Yes, it's also available in the web page, yeah. Thank you, Jessica. Peggy, this in from Liberty County. Haver has a different way of measuring severity of winters than other parts of the state. <laughs> so it must have been a comment to your last comment. So um, how does a producer go about making a decision to put alternative crops in the, in his thing in a triangle area where there is some different weather patterns than the rest of the state? Um, very good question. I don't know if I have a very good answer, but I'll give it a try. Um, 
So looking at alternative crops in our part of the state, um, look at what, what we're trying to do at the research center, look at, check with extension agents. If there's something you think might grow, um, look to us for the research to see if we've tried to grow it before instead of just going out and planting it yourself. Um, a lot of people want to do their own on-farm trials to figure things out, which is absolutely wonderful. Like Jessica says, we learn a lot from farmers too. And wow, we should have been doing this or we need to try this also. Don't be afraid to look to see what your neighbors are doing, or what has worked for them. Um, and then trying different alternative crops around um, know you have a market for it before you before you grow it. That that's huge. Just don't. Wow, this this is selling wonderful. Uh, grow it and then get ready to sell it, and you're stuck with the seed. So market is huge. Um, is the seed available to plant? What are your herbicides? I mean, there's there's a whole long list of things you need to look at before you jump into an alternative crop. Uh, herbicide residuals. You know, people that have been wheat on wheat on wheat, pretty safe with it. They're jumping into a lentil or a canola or something else. We need to be sure we know herbicide residuals and things like that. Um, Kent, Kent kind of discussed, you can use your drill to seed it. Know you can actually seed it and know you have the right equipment to harvest it. So um, markets are huge. Keep, it, keep your acres small. Don't put everything in one, all your eggs in one basket, so to speak. So, um, and know, I guess, going into something that um, you have limited knowledge on how this is going to grow. Don't have the highest expectations that you're going to hit that high yield because it's something totally new and it's a big learning curve when it's the first time planting anything. Um, researchers, we know that we should know how to grow anything because we're a researcher, but the same learning curve for us, like the, the Krenza grass, um, the quinoa here that we've started to plant, you know, how do we plant it? When do we plant it? Seeding rate, seeding date, how do we harvest it? Everything like that. So start small and know it's gonna be a big learning curve for you. Don't hesitate to ask anybody and everybody questions. Yeah, let me toss this out to the rest of the panel. Anybody else got any thoughts on the decision process or? I'd say start small is a really good comment. <laughs> I had a guy down here the first time he grew lentils grew it on like a thousand acres and it was kind of a disaster mostly because of herbicide carryover. So start do it on 20, 20 acre whatever small is to you 20 to 100 acres max I think. Because you know, it's a disaster you don't want a disaster on a thousand acres. Good point. Also the growers actually ask about that the winter conditions are different in heaven and other places probably if that too harsh, you may really need to be careful instead of looking for the four seeding crop, probably look on the cool season or warm season spring crop. So. Yep. So we're, we're just about getting ready to our last, we're gonna end at uh, 10 till 11 so we can get the next group in here. Um, I have a really quick question for Chen Si. Chen Si, what's one of the most important things you've been researching pulses since you started at Montana State University? And this question's coming in from Petroleum County. What's one or two things when you grow pulses that make the most difference in, in yields and protein and profitability? Well, cropping systems, okay, rotation. What kind of cropping system? And for the new grower, Ken actually mentioned that earlier, Becky also, the herbicide, in it history is really critical. And the second thing you need to, for annual cropping, again, need to look at the moisture, what kind of moisture you have, allow you to do annual cropping or not. So currently um, the market kind of slow. So you need to really particularly when you grow green pea or chickpea, make sure you contact the buyer, have a contract for the chickpea. So the growing chickpea need to be very careful because it's a, the seed is expensive and the price can low and then the probably have some risk of the azacacaita, the disease issue can be very costly if you're not doing correctly, so. Okay, uh, we're, we're about out of time, but would everyone of you agree that locally adapted research plays a big part in figuring out what alternative crops uh, 
grow and intensity, even with your pulse questions, that's a pretty important factor that they, they get that data from, from the local research centers or wherever they're at. We have, uh, for, we have a variety trial at um, many research centers and annual, every year we have a report like published that available for everybody and also each research center like Peggy can all participate in a variety trial you can get information from them too so from uh, perfect thanks Chen C. um everybody's email is listed at montana state university it's montana.edu you can look any one of our panelists up and get their emails. They'd be happy to field any more questions. And if they can't answer the questions, I promise you, they will get it to a person that can address that for all the people that are out there in cyber world. Um, I wanna thank our four panelists today um, for alternative crops, water use, and we've covered a lot of ground. Um, looking forward to them being harvested and getting the data out. And with that, thank you very much for all of you taking your time. <laughs>